Hey everybody, it's uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Matthew Weaver, Matt, who's going to tell us about the equations defining Reese algebras of ideals in hypersurface rings. Matt. Thank you. Um, I just want to say really quick, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I'm uh, very happy to be here. All right, so let's get started. So as the title suggests, I'm gonna be talking about the equations of Reese algebras. So maybe just a little introduction, what is a Reese algebra? So just a little bit background to get started. So let's just recall, if I have an Ethereum ring R and an R ideal, I can construct the Reese algebra as being the graded ring whose graded components, the Reese's pieces, if you will, are exactly the corresponding power of the ideal I attached with an indeterminate so that I might view this as sitting within the uh, polynomial ring, the single variable over uh, my original ring R. And this is sometimes called the blow up algebra. And indeed, most of the motivation to study this is from algebraic geometry. This ring is really encoding all of the algebraic data of the blow up of the spectrum of R along the sub scheme defined by I. And now to get to the equations, if I say, take a generating set of my ideal I, there's this natural epimorphism of R algebras of the polynomial ring over my original ring R and exactly number of generators, many variables onto the Reese algebra. And this map is obtained just by sending each one of those fret new uh, variables into the uh, degree one algebra generator of the Reese algebra. And of course, this is an epimorphism. So if I wish to study the Reese algebra, the target, I just need to understand the kernel, which is what we call the defining ideal of the Reese algebra. Now in the title, I talked about equations and so those are exactly the minimal generators of the defining ideal. And if I can determine what those equations are, I can tell you everything you'd like to know about the Reese algebra. And so that's fantastic, but there is a drawback. In general, this is a difficult problem. And you might think, well, I'm just trying to consider a generators of a kernel can't be too bad. But if you look at what that kernel might be, well, this is all the expressions in the new variables T1 through Tn such that when I evaluate at the generators, I get zero. Those are exactly the polynomial relations among the generators of I. And so usually the hard part is not cooking up what some of those uh, relations might be. The problem is usually figuring out when you've found all of them. And so this problem is too difficult in general. So what I'm going to do instead is take this map, and we'll take a slight detour through a better, more well understood algebra. And the natural candidate is the symmetric algebra because we know everything about that with a little bit more information about I. And indeed I can cut across this map, uh, which I'll call sigma onto the symmetric algebra and then onto the Reese algebra. And if I know a little bit more about I, say a presentation, I know exactly what that kernel of sigma is. And so if I have a presentation, we'll say RM to RN to I, well, the generators of that kernel onto the symmetric algebra are exactly the entries of the matrix product, where I take my presentation matrix and multiply on the left by those n new variables. So that's fantastic. A presentation is good enough to understand this. And so in some sense, I'm approximating the Reese algebra through the symmetric algebra. And with that, I can actually approximate the defining ideal of the Reese algebra with the defining ideal of the symmetric algebra. And by the commutativity of this diagram, we get this nice inclusion. And so a natural question is, well, is that it? And the answer is usually no. This containment is usually strict. The defining ideal J is usually much larger than L, but they can be equal. And in which case we say that I is an ideal of linear type. And we say that, and we use the notation L for a good reason, um, that these uh, equations defining the symmetric algebra are exactly the degree one uh, component of the defining ideal J of the Reese algebra. So we use L for linear. So like I said, I'm going to try to approximate the Reese algebra with the symmetric algebra and approximate J with L, but I might want to put on some conditions to ensure that this is a good approximation. And that's where we get the GS conditions. And so just as a quick definition, we're going to say that an ideal satisfies the condition GS. If I'm saying something about how big it can be, locally. And so we say I is GS if locally at some prime ideal P is generated by at most height P for all primes containing I within a certain range up to height uh, S minus one. 
And if for some reason I satisfies GS for all S, we'll say it satisfies G infinity. And so I'm really just saying this as it is controls the height uh, or the number of generators of my idea locally. It's not clear how that might help me out. But before we get into that, it's useful to remark that this can also be rephrased in terms of heights of determinental ideals. So using a fittings lemma, we can also rephrase this definition satisfying GS, if and only if uh, my fitting ideals of I uh, satisfy a uh, lower bound within a certain range. And that's going to be particularly useful when we take I to be a grade two perfect ideal or in general if I is itself determinental. Okay, so now why is this helpful? This is a definition, what good does it do me? Well, if I recall the theorem of Hunicke and Rossi um, for the dimension of the symmetric algebra, the minimal number of generators of the ideal locally is directly uh, connected to the dimension of the symmetric algebra. And if I put an upper bound, well, really what this allows me to do is control the dimension of the symmetric algebra, or actually bring it closer to the dimension of the Riesz algebra. And so with that, if I satisfies GS for a large enough S, well, there's less room for a kernel between the symmetric algebra and the Riesz algebra. And since the kernel of that map is exactly J modulo L, the two ideals have to be closer in some sense. And that's fantastic. And so you might say, well, let's assume the largest GS uh, I can, let's say G infinity. And that's a great idea, but sometimes that does too good of a job. And for the ideals that we're going to consider, G infinity is actually going to be too strong and actually imply a linear type. So we're gonna say, okay, what's the next best thing from G infinity? Well, if you look at the uh, heights in the range in the definition of GS, you can see, well, certainly G infinity is what you get by getting that inequality for all the prime ideals up to S minus one. So G infinity is the same thing as G dimension plus one. So the next best thing is G dimension of the ring R. And that's what we're eventually going to assume. Okay, so we figured out what do we need to get a good approximation that isn't, of course, trivial when they're, when they're not equal, but there's still some missing equations. Where are they gonna come from? And the last thing before we get into it is I want to introduce the notion of a Jacobian dual. And this will often serve as the source of those missing equations. So again, let's take a, a presentation of my ideal, Rn to Rn to I, I'm assuming I is N generated. And I'm going to specify a generating set for the ideal of entries. We'll say x1 through xs. And those might be variables, but they don't need to be. And in our case, they will actually be indeterminates eventually. Well, if I just recall, I get the equations defining the symmetric algebra by multiplying on the left of my presentation matrix with the, ver uh, the row of the t's, t1 through tn. And I'm going to say that there's another matrix, which is s by m, where M is that first Betty number and S is the number of uh, generators in that ideal of entries, it's just that I can sort of reverse the roles, the T's versus the entries of my matrix. And I'm going to refer to such a matrix as a Jacobian dual of my presentation. And this is useful because it's a wonderful consequence of Kramer's rule. If I take the S by S minors, that has to live inside the defining ideal because they conduct the, the ideal the, uh, of X's into L, which is of course living in J. But there are some downsides, namely we say a Jacobian dual because it's not necessarily unique, but there are some interests when it is unique and certainly we would like it to be unique in which case we'll call it the Jacobian dual. And if R is a standard graded ring and my presentation matrix consists of linear entries, it is actually unique, in which case we call it the Jacobian dual. And so eventually we're actually going to impose both of those assumptions, a standard graded ring, and we're going to assume our ideal has linear presentation. Okay, and with this, I think we're ready to introduce uh, the result that we're actually going to try to generalize today. All right, so we are going to study this theorem of Mori and Ulrich from the mid 90s. And they were able to determine the Jacobian or uh, the defining ideal of the Riesz algebra in this particular case. If I take my ring to be a polynomial ring and I have a, uh, a perfect ideal of grade two that satisfies GD with linear presentation, then that is exactly all the defining ideal is. The ideal from the symmetric algebra 
and those minors of the Jacobian dual. And with that, the Reese algebra was shown to be cohen macaulay And this is a really wonderful result on its own. And this was really one of the big results for uh, Reese algebras and their defining ideals for ideals that weren't the linear type. Around this time phrase, it was a big, um, people were trying to show uh, certain classes of ideals were of linear type. So this is uh, interesting that this was the first ideal that really wasn't linear type, but the defining ideal was still known. And it was such a big result that they went ahead and called L, the defining ideal of the symmetric algebra plus the minors of the Jacobian dual, the expected form of J. And there's been a lot of work done recently asking what happens if I change any of these assumptions or can I still get the expected form of the defining ideal? And some of the most uh, recent have been the first being in 2014, where when uh, considered the exact same assumptions, but with the GD minus one condition instead of GD, Boswell and McCundin then two years later considered an idea with almost linear presentation, meaning that instead of a presentation matrix with all linear entries, um, the presentation matrix, um, all of the columns with the exception of one are linear and that last column consists of entries of some higher arbitrary degree. And then it might be a little presumptuous to put my name on this, but uh, this is what we're going to do today. And we're going to consider what happens if we change the ring. And I'm a little nervous. I put 2021 there. That means I need to uh, get this paper on the archive by the end of the year. So uh, this hasn't been submitted yet. Um, yeah. And so it's actually, it's actually somewhat ironic because Maury and Orrich called this the expected form. And in all three of these cases, uh, the defining ideal of the Reese algebra was determined, um, but it was not of the expected form. So I've started calling uh, L plus the minors of the Jacobian dual the unexpected form. Okay, and so let's, uh, let's investigate. What do I mean? I wanna start doing the same thing with the hypersurface ring. Well, let's go ahead and see if I can set up some notation and let's keep all these same results, except just change the ring. So how do I make a hypersurface ring? Well, I'm gonna start with a polynomial ring and I'm gonna factor out a principal ideal. So since I still want D to represent the dimension of my ring, I'm going to say I have a polynomial ring in D plus one variables, and I'll take F to be my factored equation of degree M, and we'll let R be S module F. Then certainly I wanna take a grade two perfect R ideal, which satisfies the GD condition, and I want its Hilbert Birch presentation matrix to consist of linear entries. Okay. And as we, we have right now, we have exactly the same assumptions as the Mori Ulrich result. But I'm actually going to add two more. I'm going to assume that the ideal of entries of our presentation matrix is the homogeneous maximal ideal of R. And I'm going to assume that I is generated by dimension plus one many elements. Now that first assumption is actually, of course, not, not a huge stretch since the entries are linear. Um, and whereas it wasn't stated in the mori Ulrich result, they actually do get this for free just because that G condition being rephrased in terms of heights of fitting ideals guarantees that the ideal of entries has height at least D and then by linearity and then being in a polynomial ring, it has to be that ideal. So for us, we have the same thing. The ideal of entries has height at least D but that doesn't guarantee that we get uh, the ideal of entries being equal to this ideal. So it's not a huge assumption, but it definitely needs to be mentioned. Now that second assumption, that is pretty restrictive. We're going to assume that I is generated by D plus one many elements. And this might seem like, like I said, very restrictive, but in some sense, it's actually not. For these type of ideals, grade two perfect ideals or strongly cohen macaulay ideals in, generate, in general with this high G condition, um, if they're generated by dimension or fewer many elements, they're actually automatically G infinity and of linear type. So this is usually the first step that one considers being uh, D plus one generated. Um, and from there, one usually figures out that result and then lets the number of generators be anything D plus one or larger. And in fact, going back to those previous results, uh, the GD minus one case, the almost linear presentation case, um, those are also assuming that I is generated by dimension plus one many elements. 
and I'm saying that uh, nothing can be said from there. It just hasn't just hasn't happened yet. And actually, historically, that's exactly how this theorem of Moria Orge came about. Um, they consider, or somebody considered the uh, D plus one case, a couple people actually. Um, and then from there, Moria and Orge generalized it to any number of generators. And it's important to note that in the D plus one generation case, the Jacobian dual is actually a D by D matrix. So that ideal minors is actually a principal ideal generated by the determinant. And so that's actually going to be the theme of today. Some ideal generating, uh, defining the symmetric algebra plus the determinant of a matrix. So we'll hold on to that, but we'll come back later. Um, okay, enough of, of the assumptions. We've got everything we need. And I want to ask the burning question. If I take the defining ideal of the Reese algebra, is it exactly L, the ideal defining the symmetric algebra, plus the minors of the Jacobian dual? And we need to take the D plus one by D plus one minors because there are D plus one entry, um, generators of the ideal of entries. Well, this would be a very short talk if the answer was yes. So of course the answer must be no. And there's a couple of red flags here. And the big one being notice that in this case, the Jacobian dual is a D plus one by D matrix. So I don't even have enough columns to make a determinant, let alone an ideal of minors. And the way, and the reason that this happens is because the dimension is of course D, but the ideal of entries is still D plus one generated. So unlike the polynomial ring case, the number of variables in the dimension are no longer the same. And that's what's causing this to happen. Hmm. Well, that's somewhat frustrating. And in this setting, it's not clear, well, where do we go from here? Certainly I'm missing some equations because I don't get equality, but it's not clear where they're going to come from. And so there's a couple other indicators, but overall the theme is, this is not the right setting to work in. And so in that Mori Orch result, they were able to benefit very much being in a polynomial ring. And so I'm gonna say, Let's do the same thing. Let's get back to a better situation. Because again, I've made no assumptions on F. I'm not saying F is irreducible. You could take any one of those variables, raise it to a power. You could take the product of all of them. R could be a very reduced, um, unreduced ring. So um, there could be lots of torsion. I, I don't really want to work in here. So let's say, you know what? The first step in uh, treating ideals in hypersurface rings is to get back to a polynomial ring. So let's say, let's go all the way back to F. And I know that I can get back to R anytime I want just by going module F. And so to denote that, let's uh, let bar denote uh, images module F. And the first thing I'm gonna consider is that presentation matrix. I'm going to say let psi be a matrix with the same size as phi living with entries in S so that if I take the images of those entries down in R, I get exactly phi. And that's fantastic, but what can I do with that? Well, as it turns out, by creating this matrix psi, there's actually a grade two perfect ideal of S that has psi as its presentation matrix. And it's worth noting that psi is itself essentially unique as long as the degree of F, which we called M is at least two. And if M happens to be equal to one, psi is not unique, but uh, most of the assumptions that we're going to impose are, can be chosen. And we really don't care so much about the degree one case um, because then we're back in a polynomial ring and we recover the Mori Orch setting. And so how can I see this, that there's another grade two perfect ideal floating around? Well, of course that has to be the Hilbert Birch theorem. Well, since psi is D plus one by D, all I need to show is that the D by D minors of psi have height at least two. And that's actually really easy to show because if you take that ideal of minors, push it down into R, take its images and, and the, the factoring, well, certainly the height can only decrease. But if you take images in R, well, by linearity of determinants, you're going to hit exactly the minors, the D by D minors of phi. And since phi presents a grade two perfect ideal, certainly that ideal of minors is height two. So lifted back up to S, that uh, ideal has to have height at least two, hence exactly two. And that's usually the theme how for most of these results that we pass back and forth from R to S. What else can I say? Well, since the ideal of entries of phi 
was the homogeneous maximal ideal. Same thing holds for psi. And moreover, J satisfies the GD condition. And you can see that exactly the same way that we showed that there was a grade two perfect ideal. Because again, the GD condition can be rephrased in terms of heights of minors. Take one of those fitting ideals, push it downstairs into R, the height can only decrease. And since it satisfies the lower bound downstairs, it certainly has to satisfy it upstairs. And that's fantastic. But as it turns out, we can do better. Not only is J GD, J is GD plus one. And you can see that, well, how do I make the lift from GD to GD plus one? All I need to check is the D fitting ideal. Well, the D fitting ideal is exactly the ideal of entries. And certainly that has height D plus one. And that's awesome because here, well, J lives in S, which is D plus one dimensional. I can use that Mori Ulrich result to understand the Reese algebra of J and you can, but you can actually do even better. Maybe we've done too good of a job because J is not even just GD plus one. It is G infinity and hence linear type. And that's just because it's linearly presented to grade two perfect ideal and it's generated by dimension many elements. And if, it were, if it's generated by dimension or fewer many elements, we get G infinity. So maybe we did too good of a job, but that's okay in either case. We know the defining ideal of the Reese algebra of J. And the big theme, which is essential to the proof, is figuring out how to relate the defining ideals of the two Reese algebras, the Reese algebra of J and the Reese algebra of I. Well, we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves right now. And really what we're doing is building up more notation. So I apologize, um, the notation is gonna get a little bit cumbersome. But let's, uh, let's keep rolling, let's see what we can do. And again, I want to keep thinking that idea, approximate the Reese algebra via the symmetric algebra. And so I'm going to treat the symmetric algebra in a slightly different way. And so I'm going to say, let's start with the defining idea of the symmetric algebra of J. And remember, if I want the symmetric algebra, all I need to do is take my presentation matrix, multiply on the left by the, the new variables, T1 through T, D plus one, because both J and I are D plus one generated. And again, we'll call that L1 through LD. And those are the equations defining the symmetric algebra of J. And I'm gonna tweak that ever so slightly. I'm gonna say, take the ideal generated by those entries and throw in the factored equation F, which is in some sense, the defining ideal of R. And I'm gonna call that L and sort of an, an abusive notation because of course, F isn't necessarily linear. Well, what's special about this ideal? Well, notice if I push it down module F, I actually get this defining ideal of the symmetric algebra of I. And certainly modulo F, well, I lose that uh, equation that I just added. And I can get the remaining entries, we'll say little L1 bar to little LD bar. And I can get those by putting a bar on top of psi in that matrix product. But we've already seen that if I take images of the entries of psi, I get phi. And so with that, I can also say, well, what happens if I factor it out L from S adjoined the T's? Well, with a little bit of third isomorphism razzle-dazzle, I can say that's the same thing as R, because at R is S module F, adjoined the new variables module L bar. And since that's the defining idea of the symmetric algebra, of course I get sim I. So in some sense, I can view L as another defining idea of the symmetric algebra but as an S algebra. And that's important because L lives inside S adjoined T1 through TD plus one, which again is just some large polynomial ring, a polynomial ring S adjoined more variables. That's a good setting to be in as opposed to L bar in R adjoined T1 through TD plus one. And so if I can study L in there, and once I figure something out, if I wanna to get to the defining ideal in the traditional sense, all I need to do is go module F, and I'm back in the, the usual setting. So a natural question is, I've created this sort of S analog for the defining ideal of the symmetric algebra. Is there something similar for the Reese algebra? And the answer is yes, of course, because going from S to R is an epimorphism, but I wanna be able to choose the right ideal in some sense. 
So there's one more bit of notation that we're going to add, and then we'll sort of recap what we've done so far. So let's go ahead and let's go, go back to R and let's say let J be the defining ideal of the Reese algebra in the, in the traditional sense. And we'll say L bar, just as before, is the defining ideal of the symmetric algebra. Well, if I can produce a nice description of J, then we're in business and we get one from the GD condition. Since I satisfies GD, we actually say it is linear type on the punctured spectrum. And the way you can see that is remember that any G condition tells you how I is generated locally and all of the assumptions will pass uh, to a localization. And so actually, if you localize at any prime ideal, with the exception of the homogeneous maximal ideal, IP will be so small that it's actually G infinity. It'll be generated by height many elements or fewer. And so that tells me locally, the symmetric algebra and the Reese algebra agree for all prime ideals with the exception of the homogeneous maximal ideal. And of course, if my two algebras agree, their defining ideals have to agree locally. And we're again, L and J, L bar and J are the defining ideals of the symmetric algebra and Reese algebra. And since this happens for all primes with the exception of the homogeneous maximal ideal, it follows that some power of that maximal ideal multiplies J into L bar, meaning I can write J as a saturation of L bar against uh, X1 through XD plus one bar. And this is nice in some sense. This is a saturation and there's lots of tools that we have to compute generators of a saturation. But what's the problem? This is a saturation in R adjoined T1 through TD plus one. And again, that could be a very ill-behaved ring. And so that's happening downstairs uh, as an R algebra. And we want some nice analog happening upstairs in, in S adjoined T1 through TD plus one. So we're gonna do the natural thing and say, get those bars out of here. And we're gonna say, let's let A be the saturation of L, which is the ideal from before, defining the symmetric algebra as an S algebra against the homogeneous uh, S maximal ideal. Okay, and that's the last bit of notation that we're going to introduce, I promise. Well, I, I actually don't wanna make that promise. There's more to come later. Um, and if there are any questions, please, please stop me. Okay, so let's just take a recap. What have we done so far? Well, we spent all this time making this comparison. Do I wanna work in R? Do I wanna work over S? Let's just keep, um, keep track of the things that we've created. So I wanna make just a little chart showing the things, the traditional things that live in R and some of the analogs that we've created that live in S. So of course I started with my Hilbert Birch matrix V and we used that, we lifted it to S to create psi. Well, from phi, we had this uh, grade two perfect ideal I, and using psi, we created our analog, the grade two perfect ideal J. And we said, well, J I satisfies GD, and by lifting, we showed that J was GD plus one, or actually G infinity, we did too good of a job. Well, from there, we introduced L bar and L. We kind of came up with those at the same time. And remember, both of those are defining ideals of the symmetric algebra of I, but one is as a factoring of R adjoined the T's and the other is a factoring of S adjoined the T's. And lastly, using the GD condition, we created that description of J, the defining ideal of the Reese algebra in the traditional sense. And then we produce script A, the defining ideal of the Reese algebra as a factoring of S adjoined the T's. And so the, col the items in the column on the left-hand side, those are the usual suspects that one considers but we're gonna to transition to work with the guys on the right-hand side. So just trying to stay organized, there's a lot of notation floating around. And if you don't like this chart, we can actually put all of these objects in a nice commutative diagram. And so here I have this really horrible large diagram, but it's sort of helping me organize where the things live. And again, the, the items on the right-hand side Usually one uses the commutativity of that bottom right triangle to study the Reese algebra. We're gonna to transition to that bottom left triangle. And so instead of using L bar, the defining idea of the symmetric algebra to approximate J, we're gonna use L to approximate A. 
And then once I figure out any information I want to get back to the usual setting, all I need to do is go module F and we're back. We're back home. Okay. So let's go ahead and like I said, we're going to start working with A and L. So let's go ahead and try and do some information about A from L. And so let's just recall, remember A is a saturation of L against the homogeneous maximal ideal of S. And if I just recall, how did I get my generators of L? Well, they were the entries L1 through LD, which I got from the matrix product, T1 through TD plus one times psi. And then I went ahead and I tossed in F. And the thing to realize is that since psi consists of linear entries, L1 through LD are linear with respect to the x's. And so all my equations are linear, except for that last guy, f. And this is important to realize because this was exactly the situation that Boswell and McCundin uh, encountered. And I've mentioned those names before earlier. They were the ones who considered the Moriorich result, but for an, uh, an idea with almost linear presentation. And so they came up with this exact same thing, a saturation of linear terms um, or linear generators with the exception of one, except in their case, they got that from a non-linear column of the presentation matrix. But the nice thing is, even though that we've come up to this in a different way, we can sort of follow the path that they've set out. And the first thing that we can do is using similar techniques is we can say something about the index of saturation. And so we can't quite replicate all of Boswell McCundin's results, but most of them. Uh, but for most of the analogous results that we prove, we actually have to use different techniques. Um, and that's just because Boswell and McCundin very much relied on that they had a prime saturation, an assumption that we don't necessarily have. But regardless, we're going to follow the, the path that they've let out. And so using degree arguments, I can say that instead of a saturation, a is actually just a plain old colon ideal into the nth power of that maximal ideal. And one can either use tools from local cohomology or a little bit of residual intersections and then some degree arguments. Um, either way, uh, we come up with this nice um, index of saturation being exactly the degree of that one nonlinear equation F. Okay, well, I still need to figure out what are the generators of A. And a good technique is to say, well, let's do some good old fashioned linear algebra and associate a matrix to the generators of L in this sequence. And in the traditional sense, that's usually the Jacobian dual. But there's a problem. The Jacobian dual isn't actually good enough. We're actually going to have to fix it in some sense or modify it. So again, let's just remember the generators of L are L1 through LD and then F. And I can get L1 through LD by multiplying either on the left of the presentation matrix psi by the T variables, or I can produce the Jacobian dual and multiply on the left by the ideal of entries, which is of course the um, X1 through XD plus one. And so I can see the Jacobian dual does a pretty good job, but it's missing something, namely F. In some sense, it doesn't see that. And I'd really like it to see all of F. So why don't we make it CF? And I'm going to go ahead and introduce another column for the Jacobian dual, because those first D columns are seeing L1 through LD. But I'm going to let del F be a column, such that if I multiply on the left by the variables, by the x's, I get F back. And I'm using that del notation because I really want you to be thinking of partial derivatives or the Euler formula. Well, once I've created that column, I'm going to stack it onto the, F, the end of the Jacobian dual, and I'm going to call it the modified Jacobian dual. And uh, yeah, just as I said, we want to be thinking about partial derivatives. And indeed, if we want, because units don't really matter, if the characteristic of uh, the field which S lives over is zero, go ahead and take partial derivatives. But there's many different choices for those columns. And so the modified Jacobian dual is actually not unique. So we call it a modified Jacobian dual. And the thing to realize is remember, we had that problem with the Jacobian dual way back before the Jacobian dual of phi was d plus one by d. 
Well, of course, the Jacobian dual of psi is the same size, and it didn't have enough columns to make a determinant, but I just added a column, and now I get a d plus one by d plus one square matrix. And if I have a square matrix, that means I can take a determinant. And so we'll go ahead and see, does that do the trick? Namely, well, the first thing I notice is that if I take the determinant, just as for the Jacobian dual, that has to live in this uh, saturation or this colon ideal by Kramer's rule, being because it conducts the ideal of X's into L. And a natural question to ask is, is that good enough? Because again, we remember the mori ulrich result is exactly L, some ideal defining a symmetric algebra, plus the determinant of a matrix in the D plus one generation case. And unfortunately, the answer is still no. But there is a slight upshot. The answer is yes, if the degree of F is one. Again, this is a case that we don't really care very much again about because that puts us in the setting of mori ulrich but it's still, kind of reassuring, this tells us we're on the right track. And better yet, the determinant of that matrix plus L is exactly the colon into the first power, which of course sits inside of A because it's the colon into a higher power. Okay, well, I still need to ask myself, what should I do to get more equations? I'm still missing them. Well, here's maybe an idea Let's say suppose m is two or higher, because again, if m is one, we're done. And let's say I want to work my way up to that, the colon into the nth power by coloning into the second power, the third power, and so on. And let's say maybe you look at that second power, and just this wonderful pro property of colon ideals is that they respect powers and more generally multiples in the second, uh, in the second component. And so I can write the colon into the second power as the colon of the colon. And if I just recall that L colon the X's is exactly L plus the determinant. Okay, so if I wanna build up or start working in uh, the colon into the second power, well, that's really a colon into the first power in disguise. And that's what we just did. And so I wanna ask, can I do the same thing? Can I take the generators of L plus the determinant to B, which is that first colon, can I make a new matrix with respect to the same sequence and then maybe take a determinant again? And then maybe I'll try and do something similar to get into the third power, the fourth power, so on and so on. And indeed that is the right idea to, to handle this. And so let's go ahead and sort of keep track of sort of these things. And what we're going to do is actually produce triples of ideals, matrices, and determinants. And I'm going to refer to this as the method of modified Jacobian dual iterations. And so just as before, I'm gonna let del denote any column which corresponds to an element that makes a column uh, out of it um, with respect to the sequence x1 through xd plus one. And again, we should be thinking of partial derivatives. And let's just go ahead and see what have we done so far. Well, I had my ideal L, I had my modified Jacobian dual, and I took a determinant of it. And since I'm gonna be doing something similar at every step, I'm gonna go ahead and index them. So I'll say, let's produce triples, L's, B's, and F's. We'll say the first L is just L, what we started with. B1 will just be the Jacobian dual, just the regular Jacobian dual with the del F attached to it. And then we took a determinant. And then what did we do? Well, we took that determinant and we added it to L or L1. And here comes the moment of truth, the formation of a matrix associated to the generators of this ideal. But I'm actually not going to hit all of the generators of that ideal. I'm gonna say little f is in there, but in some sense, it's done its job. It was used to create the modified Jacobian dual. I took a determinant, it gave me this new equation F1. So I'm gonna say, let's get rid of the column corresponding to little f and let's make a column corresponding to this new fresh equation, F1. And since I've just gotten rid of a column, put a new column in there, I still have a square matrix. It's fair game to take a determinant. And let's call that F2. And of course, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this, but now that I have a new equation, let's go ahead and keep track of that, add that to L2, 
which is just L1 plus F1 plus F2. So I just keep building up that L idea one equation at a time. Well, I've already used F1. So let's get rid of the column corresponding to it and make a column corresponding to F2. And of course we can take a determinant again and let's just keep going. And so we have this nice recursive process or iterating my matrix. And you might ask, does this go on forever? And the answer is no, this has to stop. And the way that you can see that is by some degree reasons. So notice since Psi was, uh, had linear entries in the Xs, the Jacobian dual B of phi is linear in the Ts and actually pure in the Ts, those entries. And so when I take a determinant at each step, the X degree is exactly the same thing as the X degree of the, that one last column. So it doesn't change from taking a determinant. But notice when I make a column, the X degree actually decreases. And again, you can think about this as taking partial derivatives. So at each step, I take a derivative, the degree decreases. And so asking when does this end is the same thing as asking how many derivatives can I take before I hit zero? And for our homogeneous polynomial, the answer is exactly the degree, which we called M. So maybe the very last uh, line is LM and BM, and I'm purposely not going to make an FM. And the point is, or what I can do with this, is if I repeat Kramer's rule over and over and over again, making colons of colons of colons, the ideal that I get at each line, the, uh, the ith L and the ith B, its determinant, has to live inside the colon into the ith power of the maximal ideal. Okay, well, this is interesting to look at the nth step because I know that the colon into the nth power is exactly A. And so it'd be nice to know, do I get a quality or do I get a quality at maybe the lower steps? Certainly we know that we do uh, for the first step. And the answer is actually yes for all of the i's up to m, but in particular, we can ask, is this all of a, what I get at the end of this process? And the answer is finally yes, which is good. I hope that we do get there by, by the end. And moreover, this is actually a minimal generating set, and that it follows from the degree arguments just from before. And so to distinguish between the x degree and the t degrees, we usually introduce a bigrading, letting the x degrees be in the first component and the t degrees in the second component. And as we mentioned, the x degree decreases by one at every single step. Again, we were thinking that from a differentiation standpoint, but the t degree actually goes up by the dimension from one step to the other step. And so at the ith step, I will have subtracted uh, one i many times from the x degree and I'll have added the dimension d many times to the t degree. Uh, so I get this wonderful um, by degrees where the x degrees go down, the t degrees go up, I can control it. And then by degree reasons, this is actually minimal. And we can actually record the minimal number generator, the minimal number of generators of A as the d plus one generators of L plus the m determinants that we took. And then if I want to get back to the original setting of J, well, module F, of course, F is one of the minimal generators of A. So of course it has to de decrease by exactly one. And this is fantastic. This description really tells me a lot. So not only have I given a description of the defining ideal, but we can also talk about other invariants of the Riesz algebra, or at least in the Moriorich case, the, um, the invariant is question was the depth of the cohen macaulay -ness. So that's gonna be our next question. Is the Riesz algebra cohen macaulay and if I want to talk about the cohen macaulay ness well, the hard part is usually the depth, but let's just recall that the dimension of the Riesz algebra is fixed at one more than the dimension of my ring because I is a positive, an ideal positive grade. So as for the depth, using the description of the defining ideal that we just produced, and again, talking about A as a defining ideal um, of the Riesz algebra as a factor ring of uh, the polynomial ring over S, we can actually find that the depth of the Riesz algebra is at least D. So if we're not cohen macaulay we're at least very close. And we can actually break it up into some cases. When do I get cohen macaulay -ness? And that actually happens if M is one, the degree of F, the factored equation 
So if m is equal to one, then my Riesz algebra actually is cohen macaulay And that's to be expected because if m is one, after a linear change of coordinates, I can take f to be one of the variables. I'm back in the polynomial ring. I can just use that Mori Ulrich result. So in some sense, it's not interesting, but it is a cohen macaulay Riesz algebra. I'll take it. But as it turns out, if m is at least two, the depth is exactly D. That inequality uh, is actually equality because it's actually impossible for the Riesz algebra to be cohen macaulay But in this setting, we say since it's so close, as close as it could be to being cohen macaulay without being cohen macaulay we say it's almost cohen macaulay And so that's the, that's the big one, cohen macaulay of course. But we can also deduce other invariants, regularity, relations that really Anything that you'd like to know about the Riesz algebra once the defining ideal is understood, this is good. And so just to sum everything up, here's the, the main result that we've pr proved. That if I take my hypersurface ring, again, a factor ring of a polynomial ring in D plus one variables, I take my perfect idea of grade two in your presentation matrix. If I've got GD, the ideal of entries is a homogeneous maximal ideal, and I'm D plus one generated then my defining ideal is exactly what we produced. And again, this is called the mth modified Jacobian dual iteration. And it's important to realize is that we do recover Mori Ulrich's result when i is d plus one generated and the degree, is, uh, the degree of f is one. And again, you can see that just as a linear change of coordinates, you can take f to be maybe that last variable x d plus one. Um, and then in which case there's only one iteration. And once you create the ideals involved and you go modulo uh, that one variable, you actually do recover uh, the ideal defining the symmetric algebra and the determinant of the Jacobian dual with respect to the first D variables. So this is actually a true generalization in, in the D plus one case. Okay, so now that we've got a result, well, maybe let's talk about it. Where could we go from here? So certainly the next step would be to consider, well, what happens if I is generated by many, any more elements, anything greater than D plus one? Because again, that was somewhat restrictive. Well, it's not clear. Certainly the sizes of the matrices change. So instead of taking determinants of uh, modified Jacobian duals, you would take minors, um, but even then that still doesn't do it. So this method, doesn't quite work, but it, there, there is some hope for it. Okay, regardless, that's, uh, that's something we can do later. But what else can we do with this? Well, using the recent work of uh, Costantini, we can actually extend this to consider Riesz algebras and modules, which of course I haven't mentioned at all. Uh, but we can consider modules of projective dimension one over hypersurface rings, because really I can think of these modules as being the higher rank analogs of uh, grade two perfect ideals. Okay, so in addition to extending to modules, this process or something similar at least can also be adapted to other classes of ideals and their Riesz algebras. And what I've worked on most recently is uh, Riesz algebras of Gorenstein ideals of grade three over hypersurface rings. Of course, the process has to be changed and it's actually much more complicated, but it's a similar argument at heart. And really the last possibility is one could consider, you know, here I was very restricted that I only factored out one equation. What happens if you factor out more equations? And what I'm actually really interested in is Riesz algebras of ideals in complete intersection rings. Um, in particular, um, specifically modules over complete intersection rings, namely the module of differentials. Um, certainly there are factor rings of polynomial rings that aren't complete intersections, but even two factored equations is a mess. Uh, that complete intersection property is, uh, is nice. Um, yeah, so this is probably a good place to uh, stop. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Let's thank Matt. Questions? questions for Matt? Louisa. So earlier, um, right in the beginning, when you were telling us about the, the history of the problem, 
Um, you, you mentioned that recently that result had also been extended to um, ideal satisfying GD minus one. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to extend your results for hypersurfaces? To the so, that's a, so that's actually a very good question um, and actually something I've looked into. Um, so actually, so I made the assumption from the very beginning that, um, that the ideal is D plus one generated. Um, and actually you can do an awful lot um, just saying it's N generated as long as N is at least that. And in that case, uh, J is actually just GD plus one. And we got GD from uh, the ideal of entries in the presentation matrix phi. And so if you actually don't assume that, GD is actually the best you can do for J. And I've played around with it a little bit. And I think there's something there because really all one really needs is that the Reese algebra of J is Cohen Macaulay. Um, but I very much need that um, it's defining ideals of the expected form for my argument. Um, I think some something could be done there, but I don't think it would be as clean. Um, Do you think it might be true? I, I think so, um, or at least something similar. Um, in, the, in the original situation, the case of a polynomial ring, is GD minus one the best one can ask for? Like, is it false? if something just satisfies GD minus two? Um, that I'm not sure about. Um, so Moria Norwich's result is false for GD minus one, but something is similar uh, for that setting. So I'm not sure how, how much the GD minus one result fails for uh, GD minus two. Um, they, they have the same players, the ideal of defining the symmetric algebra of the Jacobian dual, but they have to factor the minors in that setting. Um, so I think it may be at some point that's going to run out, um, but I'm not sure how far you can get with it. Cool. Other questions? So you preemptively answered my question on the very last line. Of the oh, did I? <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I'm still trying to get over the whole Reese's Pieces thing. <laughs> Let's I, think uh, that yeah. again and we can stop the recording. <laughs>